Welcome back to Close Up. What happens on social media doesn't always have real world impact. But when Republican State Representative William Marsh, who is a doctor, tweeted, quote, those in our caucus who refuse to take precautions are responsible for Dick Hinch's death, it was national news. Now he continues to push his fellow reps to follow pandemic guidance. Representative Marsh is our guest this morning. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Adam. It's good to be with you today. And there aren't a lot of elected Republicans out there willing to speak out against anti-mask orthodoxy, but you took it a step further and, as we noted, said some of your fellow Republicans were, quote, responsible for the speaker's death. Why did you decide to put it in such stark terms? Well, I was really upset. Uh, I found out that I had been exposed. Uh, and this puts my personal health at risk, and uh, uh, I lost my temper. <laughs> No one knows for sure, of course, where the speaker contracted COVID-19, but you don't see it as coincidental. I don't think so. I think that if you take risks, if you meet in large gatherings with people who are not taking the reasonable precautions that we've all talked about, statistically, there you can calculate the probability of running into contact with COVID, and it gets to be close to 100% as the groups get large enough. What was the reaction among Republicans? We know some were upset, but how many came out and supported you, at least behind the scenes? Uh, th that would be a hard thing for me really to know. I think that uh, there are more Republicans who favor reasonable precautions than people realize. The ones who don't, of course, are very loud, and they will be happy to tell us what they think. You've mentioned a toxic peer pressure within the House Republican Caucus. Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean? I think there are people who really are pushing us to hold face-to-face -face meetings, large face-to-face -face meetings, without masks, without distancing, basically to try to return to business as usual and pretend that this virus is not amongst us. And, and I'm afraid, as the governor said, that that can have absolutely tragic consequences. And in this case, it did. What is the best way forward, in your opinion? It can, you know, it was the, the late Speaker Hinch's goal to meet in person in committees in the house is that a reasonable expectation or does that need to change now well i think it's clear that the voters expect a legislature that is present and reporting for duty so that we don't have to govern this state by emergency orders i mean that that's absolutely clear in my mind how to go about doing that and doing it safely is a challenge it's a big challenge um and our our uh Presumptive Speaker Sharon Packard has been working on a plan to work on air exchanges in the legislative office building to make it safer. Uh, it it uh, uh, either meets or becomes very close to meeting the CDC's guidance for reopening office buildings as far as ventilation is concerned, and I'm very encouraged by that. That being said, I personally would not feel safe meeting face to face without wearing a, a very protective mask, not just a mask, but a mask that gives uh, protection to me as opposed to those around me. It was a very decisive vote in favor of acting Speaker Packard to become the Speaker within that Republican caucus. Are you confident that he's going to take a different approach, that he does have uh, perhaps a more of a focus on the public health aspect of this pandemic? Well, I've talked to him about his plans for opening the legislature. I think they are sensible. I think that he's not going to put us at risk. Uh, and he has said that it's a really heavy lift. It's going to be hard. Um, so I do expect him to to watch out for all of us as we move forward. You've got that MD after your name. You're a doctor. Is it surprising That's to you right. that more people within your own caucus weren't willing to listen to you? I've been used to people not listening to me for a very long time. I have five children. <laughs> they don't listen to me. <laughs> Nonetheless, though, the idea that, uh, you know, you're an expert in health uh, and your opinion carries some weight. Uh, is it troubling well, to you that that didn't that, that didn't break through at all? No, no, that happens. You know, you just keep keep persisting and keep uh, saying what you believe, and people do come around. Uh, people don't realize, but the very first doctors who blew the whistle on COVID in China were ophthalmologists like me because they're right in people's faces uh, and and they get exposed. And and uh, uh, in fact, I believe that the man who first blew the whistle died. So it, it happens. Did you raise any of these concerns with the late Speaker Hinch before that caucus at McIntyre back in November? Uh, well, I was not present at the McIntyre caucus. I was uh, at that time running the Rare Disease Advisory Council, which is meeting again later this afternoon. Uh, I did send an email to him to that effect, and uh, I did not hear back from him. Do you think he do you have an opinion, I guess, on what his personal belief was about this? Or was he bowing 
if you will, to that toxic peer pressure that exists as you say it? Well, our opinions get shaped by the people around us. We know that anyone who's raised kids knows that, that your your children in high school have their opinions shaped by the other children that are around them. And I'm afraid that happens with representatives too. Uh, so I do believe that his opinion was shaped greatly by the people around him and, and in his case, tragically by the people around him. Now, your fellow Republicans in leadership didn't say anything about the cases arising from that McIntyre caucus until we ended up breaking the story right before Organization Day. Is that troubling to you at all in the sense that perhaps we won't hear about future cases that might arise within the caucus or within the legislature? Well, communication about disease for public health purposes is really an issue. We, we, we have that not just with the Republican caucus, we have that with the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm a town health officer. I inquired about an outbreak in my town, and I didn't get any information either. Now, it's true that a lot of this information is protected by HIPAA, and, and that's very reasonable. Uh, but we have to weigh that against the need to protect the public, and I suspect we will be addressing that somewhat during the next legislative session. And Governor Kristen Inouye, who you are allied with uh, on a number of issues, has said that he believes it's private health information if a state rep tests positive. Unique situation here, though, in that you know if people are going to not adhere to guidance and gather in groups, that's generally something they're doing by consent and they're getting together. But the legislature is a situation where you have some people who want to adhere to guidance and some that don't. Uh, so is there not perhaps a, a greater duty to inform then if you do have representatives that are not adhering to guidance and then you're throwing them together in situations with people who don't want to be around people who are doing that? Well, let me ask your question in a shorter way. Do I Am I personally upset if I am exposed to COVID by somebody who chooses not to share with me the fact that he just tested positive and was sick when he calls me into a meeting? Yes, I'm really ticked off by that. So uh, I think there is a responsibility to be transparent about the issue. If I could ask my questions more quickly, that's something I would want to do, too. I should uh, seek that guidance as well. Do you think you're going to continue to speak out uh, if your fellow Republicans don't adhere to guidance moving forward? I try to keep my mouth shut, Adam, but it's really hard. <laughs> so what form will that take, though? What, what, I mean, this is something that you clearly felt very strongly about with the passing of Speaker Hinch. Uh, how, what platform are you going to, to use to convey this, I guess? People have said it's troubling, perhaps, that there was going to be this much attention on the personal behavior of individual representatives. Well, people will ask me questions. I occasionally put out tweets, really not that often. I, I post stuff on my website and on my Facebook page, and I talk to people. Really, it's better most of the time to work out things behind the scenes if you can. Uh, but sometimes you can't, and you need to go public. Is being an anti-mask individual, is that being also being anti-science, in your opinion? I don't like the term anti-science, and I really don't like the term anti-mask, because there's masks and there's masks, okay? I think there's actually pretty good scientific evidence that the cloth face masks that many people have don't really offer a great deal of protection to the individual. They may offer some. The CDC now says they may offer, they may offer some. They offer more protection to the people around you. But if you really want protection, and what I intend to wear when I'm going to meetings in, in the legislature going forward, um, it is basically medical grade personal protective equipment. And we're very fortunate that that is available. And we have a company that makes it right here in New Hampshire. So uh, insofar as, as people can, uh, I think that you need to recognize that all not, not all masks are the same. It seems, if you don't like the term anti-mask and pro-mask, it's a, nonetheless a, a real division in the Republican Party. Parties try to be big tent, but is this a division that is impossible to resolve? Can, can those two ideas and groups coexist within the same party? I don't know. I don't know. I think we're going to find out. <laughs> Elaborate on that for me, if you will. Does that mean that you would have to stop being a Republican or would they have to stop being Republicans? Well, I fully intend to wear my mask and uh, because I intend to keep me personally safe. If people are upset about that, that's their problem, not mine. Uh, we know you're just one doctor and, and you're not the public health expert for the state, but what's your outlook for the rest of this session? Obviously, there's going to be some difficult things to navigate here. When do you believe it will be safe to, quote unquote, get back to normal for the New Hampshire House? 
Well, th that's actually a very good question. To get back to normal, we have to have a way of preventing the spread of disease. And people have been hanging their hopes on the COVID vaccine. Well, you need to recognize that the COVID vaccine was only tested to prevent serious symptoms in people who get infected with COVID. It was not tested uh, about preventing the spread of disease. So I don't see that as something that by itself is going to make it possible for us uh, to go back to the way things were before this happened. Uh, I suspect that with the passage of time, like most epidemics, this one will wane and not longer be present among so many people in the population. No idea how long that will take. And, and I suspect that's what it's really gonna take for things to go back to normal. Is it reasonable ex to expect, just given the numbers, that we will lose another state representative, state senator, someone in that building at the state house? Uh, statistically, I believe that the case fatality rate of COVID in the state of New Hampshire is about 2%. Uh, and given that we have 400 representatives, I would say, and considering that when diseases become en endemic, means basically everybody gets them eventually, uh, the odds are in favor that more representatives will get this disease. And if 2% of the people who get it die, it's reasonably likely that somebody else will die. All right, a stark perspective, and we thank you for sharing it with us today, Dr. Marsh. Thanks. Thank you.